to sort of motivate um, artists to create these modalities and then give you sort of uses of the, the application. Um, so um, uh, let's let's start by, by thinking uh, sort of semantically uh, and uh, uh, application based. Um, so sort of why we're interested in this stuff and what it's good for. So um, if we go way back to uh, uh, the, the 20th century, um, <laughs> In the 20th century, maybe uh, we uh, we think about the great topology as giving us information about um, spaces by uh, uh, computing algebraic invariance of them. Uh, and nowadays, in, in the 21st century, we often think about this as passing through this world of higher category theory, uh, infinity groupoids or homotopy spaces, uh, which are the things that these algebraic invariants are defined on, uh, and then we have an actual um, topological space then uh, we get information out of it by uh, mapping it into this world of homotopy theory. Uh, so classically, this would just you regard this as like taking the um, total singular simplicial complex or whatever you develop your model for the uh, And this is the world in which uh, where, where uh, ordinary homotopy type theory has ordinary semantics. So the Vronsky's first model lives in simplicial sets. Uh, and uh, so it, it's, it's a really wonderful thing for telling us things about these, this world of homotopy theory, but it's not so great for telling us things about the spaces that they came from uh, and for getting information about uh, actual topological spaces up to homeomorphism, up to, just up to homotopy equivalence. And there are lots of applications of classical algebraic topology we might be interested in um, that are basically inaccessible to ordinary homotopy type theory because it can only work up to homotopy equivalence. Um, right? So things like fixed point theorems are telling us what talking about whether there's actually a point in the space that is actually equal to its image, not just homotopic to it. They go through homotopy theory to tell us things about that, um, uh, but uh, uh, we have to at some point go back to uh, the topology. So the idea of uh, cohesive algebraic topology or cohesive uh, uh, type theory is to um, to reestablish that connection uh, by taking our actual topological spaces up to homeomorphism and our homotopy infinity groupoids and putting them together into one bigger world of continuous infinity groupoids uh, uh, in in a, in a more or less disjoint way. Uh, and uh, the, the, the reason that that is useful is that this world up here has all the nice properties of this world over here. Um, it is, it's another infinity topos, and in particular, we can interpret type theory into it. Uh, and so the, the homotopy type theory, cohesive homotopy type theory, tells us things about this world and about the relationship between the spaces and the infinity So what is a continuous infinity group void? So um, the, the intuition that I like to, to have in mind is that it's a uh, an infinity group point, so it's it's a it's a type in, in, in type theory, uh, but it also has the extra structure of topologies in the sort of point set sense uh, on all of the spaces of, of objects and organisms. Um, so uh, it might, for instance, have a, a, a space of objects, uh, but no higher um, morphisms at all. Right. So uh, we haven't. Right, we're, we're just we're we're, we're uh, teasing out the the notion of continuous path in topology from the notion of isomorphism uh, in the homotopy theory. Uh, so we can have a, a topological space of objects with nothing above that dimension. Or we can have an ordinary infinity group point with all of our homotopy theory, but no topology at all, discrete topology, or an indiscrete topology. Um, or we can sort of have both of them together. So a nice example that I like to think about is um, if I have a topological group, um, then I can, just like an ordinary discrete group can be regarded as a one-object group point, an ordinary topological group can be regarded as a topological group point. Um, so it has one object, and a G is the space of the morphisms. So we've got uh, those are the, the one morphisms, and they have a topology on them in addition to their higher categorical structure as being the morphisms. Um, now that's so that's nice for for doing um, topology and relating it to homotopy theory. But we also want to do geometry. Maybe we want to do smooth geometry or super geometry or random geometry, algebraic geometry, all different kinds of geometry. So. Um, uh, we want to get information about these things too, and we can do that in a very similar way. Instead of continuous infinity group points, we look at geometric ones, uh, and we have a geometric homotopy type theory that interprets into that and tells us things about geometry. So, what do I mean by geometric infinity group point? You can think of it in a similar way uh, as an infinity group point with compatible geometries on all the spaces, whether that's a smooth structure or uh, it's an algebraic space or whatever it is you like. Um, but now let me actually give you a definition. Uh, so uh, actually what I mean by a geometric infinity group void is an infinity sheaf on some infinity site of geometric spaces. Uh, so uh, if you don't know what infinity sheaf and infinity site means, basically what that is is I start with some small category 
of, of geometric spaces, so like manifolds or Yafan schemes or something like that. Um, and then I freely add column, infinity columns to it. Uh, I pass to its pre-sheet category, which is this free co completion, this infinity homotopy world. And then I, I, I say, well, that adds all the new columns that I've got. Um, but my, maybe my original category had some columns, not good, not all of them, but maybe some of them. Uh, and so I'll force those to stay columns in my, uh, uh, in my, uh, like in unions of open coverage, are sort of the classical example of a good column that I'd like to stick, to stick around. Uh, and so that gives me uh, a sheaf topos, a uh, cheap infinity topos. And so I, that's the thing that I can interpret um, to be type one and two. Yes. Yeah, and the example you use is just an ordinary set. Uh, that's right. And that in in most two. examples uh, that I know of, it is actually an ordinary site. Um, you don't need an infinity <coughs> here, but you, you could have an infinity here. Yes. Uh, well, uh, when I say infinity pre uh I, I, I don't mean to be prejudiced with respect to what model I have, but in practice, I'm going to model it with the And that has to do with this little hence um, uh, asterisk here, right? So, uh, right? Yeah, I actually interpret type theory into these things. We have to choose a model category that presents them, um, and generally, what we're going to do is the virtual pre and so on. I think I'll talk some more about that. Oh, I think an example where the base is not an ordinary site would be uh, the, for DAG or spectral algebraic geometry. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there are, so there are examples. Any questions? Yeah, I'm just going to ask you about the If you compare this, you said continuous on the previous slide, you said uh, you know, topologies. Are you really thinking about uh, this modeling using topological manifolds or even another? Well, you can make various choices. I mean, the, the, the one that I usually use is uh, uh, the site of uh, Cartesian space is hardly the end. So you could use manifolds, or, or you could use a larger category of topological spaces too, if you want. Depending on what cho choice you make, you get different behavior. Oh, so here's the, here, I do the let's just look at some examples, right? Uh, um, these are all, these are all uh, one set set. So this was my example of the continuous case, new case. You can add uh, infinitesimals. You can add superstructure that um, we're just going to talk about later. Uh, you can do algebraic things, outline schemes with various covers. Um, and then there are others, even fancier versions. Um, you guys see that uh, mix up some of the I think uh, Eric's going to tell us a little bit about the other ways that are So that's the, the sort of the, I mean, the overall picture of, of what we're going to accomplish uh, with uh, this <coughs> geometric so what does the type theory look like that corresponds to that? So um, we're, we're thinking about interpreting uh, type theory into this world of uh, geometric infinity points. Uh, and so one, one way to think about what's going on is that we're expanding the universe to include these geometric infinity points in addition to the original ones. But I think it's probably better to think that, to realize that what we've been doing all along might as well have been talking about uh, the geometric ones uh, in, in addition to the ordinary ones. because. Uh, it's the same type theory that we're interpreting into this, uh, this new topos. It just so happens that all the types happen to have geometric structure. Um, so yeah, and this is kind of analogous to the generalization from ordinary type theory to homotopy type theory, where instead of thinking of types as sets, uh, we say actually types might as well be infinity group voids, which we can detect that extra structure in some way. And uh, the, the, the old intuition of types as sets is still there in the zero types. Um, but we've just sort of got um, some types that aren't who happen to be zero types. And we could similarly add geometry, uh, interpreting types as geometric so objects, objects and uh, have them been some sort of discrete objects, with discrete topologies or discrete geometries that sort of be, don't behave like the ordinary world intuition. And geometric homotopy type theory is putting both of these two things together. Uh, so every type, as I said, has both infinity group voice structure and geometric or topological structure. Uh, and they could either be, one of them could be trivial or both of them could be trivial or neither one could be trivial. So I, I gave you these sort of uh, semantic examples before, like the deal with the topological group. Um, here are a couple of examples uh, inside of type theory. Let's see what this sort of looks like. Uh, so we've got two circles. Um, there's the higher inductive circle, uh, which is the one that Edward was talking about when he was localizing and uh, truncating. Uh, this is a study in the book and with things like its new spaces, the integers. And this has a higher homotopy structure. That's what this means. This, this is a higher homotopy structure, but it's geometrically discrete. Uh, it has no sort of topology or geometry on it at any level. Uh, this C is a discrete set. It has no topology. 
Um, on the other hand, uh, if we're in some geometry where we have a notion of a line object, and it might be the real numbers, or it might be some sort of algebraic affine line, uh, so I put some line on the A1 here, then um, I can define something like a, a, a geometric circle. For instance, it might be um, this uh, sort of uh, algebraic circle inside the, the plane, so A2 is A1 squared. Um, and uh, that has trivial higher structure, so it's a zero type inside of type theory, it's zero truncated. Um, but it has non-trivial geometry in general. It's going to have a topology or geometry that's induced from this mod in A1. But these are different objects. They're two different circles. They have different properties. But, but usually they have what we call the same shape. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So how do we detect um, the uh, interesting geometry uh, inside of type theory? So uh, we need to use something about geometric infinity group voids that's not true in ordinary hop. We need to add extra stuff to it somehow so that we're actually doing geometric type theory and saying something about geometry. Um, so one thing we can do is assume axioms that are true in the world in these geometric models. Uh, and uh, I might, depending on how far I go, I might mention one of those a little later. Um, but uh, the one that we, we're going to talk, talk the most about is uh, one which uh, follows an approach that uh, was pioneered by uh, Blaubert in the, in the semantic world of categories, which is to um, equip these um, type theory with modalities, uh, by which I roughly mean systems of adjoint functors. So um, Blaubert's idea was to say you have a category of uh, geometric objects, uh, geometric infinity group voids in our case, and it's related to the ordinary category of infinity group voids. Blaubert, of course, was, was thinking of the ordinary one categorical case, so we had one category of these things and uh, one category of sets on the other side of the the ideas um, carry over <coughs> uh, And so this is the simplest sort of uh, uh, adjoint relationship here that we have. Uh, we're given a geometric infinity group void, we can take its underlying ordinary one, forgetting the geometry. In the other direction, we can take an ordinary one and we can give it the discrete geometry, the discrete, discrete topology. Um, and in most cases, uh, I actually don't know uh, whether I know of any, but you know, this is not true. Usually the, this, this left adjoint here, that equips uh, something with the discrete geometry uh, is fully faithful, so that the discrete objects sort of embed into the, uh, the, the geometric ones. So the like uh, discrete topology, just topological spaces with the discrete topology are an equivalent copy of the category sets sitting inside the world of, of topological spaces. And so what that means is that there's a reflective, a co-reflective, so this should be said co-reflector, a co-reflective subcategory. Um, of discrete objects, and so that structure that can be put entirely on this category. Um, and uh, this, 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 this core reflect that we have in our pride that I'm simply flat. Uh, and uh, so it takes every type and, and it sort of um, reflects it and co reflects it into this discrete world. So that basically means take the under, forget all the geometry and make it into, give it rediscrete, retopologize it discreetly. Uh, so if I have a map from flat of x to y, um, what that means, um, so that's, uh, this is P upper star, P lower star of X. So the adjunction relationship means that this is just a map from P lower star of X to P lower star of Y. So it's a map on the underlying ordinary group wise that says nothing about the geometry of X and Y. Uh, another way of saying that is if I have a map out of a discrete infinity group void, then it's always geometric. It always preserves the geometry. There's nothing to say about that. Um, so that's, that's sort of the most basic modality uh, that you might be interested in from a, from a Oracle perspective is just these discrete objects. Um, dually, we can talk about co-discrete objects. So uh, a discrete object, every map out of a discrete object is geometric. A co-discrete one is where what every map into the is geometric. So think about the indiscrete topology on the top set. Uh, every map with, with indiscrete codomain is continuous. Uh, and uh, similarly here, so another one way to say that is that we have an adjunction here between flat and sharp. So both of the, 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 one, the, the ones a map from x, flat of x to y is just a map on underlying infinity group voids. And the same is supposed to be true here, x from x. A map from x to its co-discrete reflection, sharp of y, should just be a map on underlying infinity group voids. And uh, in many cases, the co-discrete objects are reflected with this, this, this sharp. Um, and uh, we get it, uh, all of these categories are equivalent. So the ordinary infinity group voids are embedded in two different ways, as the discrete spaces and as the indiscrete or co-discrete. So that's two of the basic uh, cohesion modalities. Um, and then there's a third one, uh, which uh, uh, I'm going to describe a little bit differently than uh, is often the case here. Uh, so uh, 
and we're suppose we're in some geometry. It's the world of geometry where I have a geometric block. So it might be the real numbers. Uh, it might be something like the real numbers with infinitesimals in it. It might be uh, in, uh, an algebraic uh, affine line uh, in some uh, cheese on, on an affine sneeze or something. But whatever it is, uh, it's something that I think of as having the, the geometry of a line. And it's got, if I, as long as it's got a couple of points in it, I can say what I mean by a geometric homotope. So in, in, in classical topological spaces, we talk about a homotopy meaning a continuous path uh, in the one category of topological spaces like this. Uh, we have a map from X across this line to Y, whose restrictions along these point zero and one are these two maps F and G. Now, right, in, in classical topology, you're used to thinking of talking about a closed interval on that uh, point from zero to one. And here I've got sort of a whole line, which sort of goes off to infinity in either direction. But in classical uh, homotopy theory, you can just sort of squash the rest of the line back to the point zero and one and make a difference. Um, in sort of algebraic cases, you probably, this is probably what you want to do rather than what you do with um, And so um, I'm going to say an object is homotopical, or you might more verbosely say geometric homotopy local, uh, if uh, every map from A1 from this line into it is, is constant in, in, in a unique way. Uh, and uh, one, uh, this is sort of a, a fancier, uh, uh, higher version, sort of higher coherent, higher version of saying that <coughs> geometric homotopy in this sense gives me a synthetic homotopy in the homotopy type theory sense, meaning an equality in the, or, or a homotopy of I'm using the equality type, the identity type. Uh, why is that? Because if I have this geometric homotopy and uh, Y is the property that maps from A1 into it are constant, then this map here, this, this, this map here uh, well, uh, another way to say that is that uh, when I, um, Y thinks that this map is an equivalence, and when my Y thinks that this map is also an equivalence, because every map out of A1 into Y is constant, uh, and so that means that uh, this actually has to be equal in the, in the, the higher homotopy sense to that. Yes. Uh, so the example that I'm guessing this comes from is uh, motivic spaces in the sense that yeah, Lebowski, the, so the notation is coming from motivic spaces, yeah. yeah. So my question is that in that particular case, uh, that localization is not in infinity tokens, right? That's right. So uh, we're, this this applies to things that are not going to be um, infinity tokens. So let's let's pay attention <coughs> to what we're doing here. Uh, so uh, I'm doing it slightly differently. I'm working in this world here, which is an infinity tokens, and now I'm talking about structure on that infinity tokens. Right. So uh, what you just said is that in general, the homotopical objects as a subcategory are not an infinity topos in their own right. And that is, that is true. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking about, so I'm studying them, talking about them inside this like, bigger world that that is. Just need shoes. What? Just need shoes. Yes, in that case, exactly. Just need shoes. Um, uh, OK. Um, so uh, they were just told us about localization uh, inside of type theory using a higher inductive type, okay? Uh, and uh, the, uh, I guess he didn't say the word nullification, but, but nullification just means localization at a map to the terminal. Okay, so uh, we say, uh, all right, this, this, is, um, this is the same as saying that uh, the homotopical objects are a, an accessible reflective subuniverse, uh, which where the generator is the knot from A1 to a point, because this is Y is the same as a knot from a point to Y. Okay. So we can do that higher inductive construction and we get a reflection into these guys and I call that the shape modality. Um, this, this symbol here looks like an integral sign but it is not, uh, just don't be lazy and, and, and write it with an integral sign, it's an ash, uh, which is the IPA symbol for a, a voiceless cold dog in the cricketer. Um, it's, it's easily available in my tag. So we, we, have, we have three modalities, uh, a sharp and flat and shape, uh, which often um, all of them exist. Uh, and, and very, very often uh, it happens that the homotopical objects are the same as the discrete ones. So um, this, this, uh, this happens in all of these continuous, smooth, differential, um, super, whatever, as long as I, I choose an appropriate line object. Uh, and, and, and in these cases too, even when the, although in that case, uh, I have to define the shape, shape a little bit differently. Um, but as, as, as Harry just pointed out, uh, in, the, in the world of algebraic geometry uh, and motivic spaces, they're not the same. The homotopical objects are different from those. 
so by, by, when we talk about cohesive homotopy type theory, we mean this world where the homotopical objects are the discrete ones. Uh, and so that means, and we have the flat and the sharp. And that means that, um, so we have the, the discrete objects that are co-reflective and the co-discrete objects that are reflective by the, the flat and sharp that are adjoined to each other. But then the discrete objects, because they're also the homotopical objects, are also reflective. That is also a reflect into the same subcategory, which is the sharp, the shape, and that's left adjointed. So we have this adjoint term. The word cohesion comes from Lavaire. Um, he studied this in, in the, the case of uh, one categories or one topos is related to the category of sets or to some other base topos by a string of adjoint functors inducing this sort of term. Okay. Um, and uh, with this, uh, so with, in, in, this, in, this, uh, uh, in this world where we have these three modalities, we can say things about how the geometry is related to the home term. So here's sort of one of the most basic examples. Um, exploit that the idea is that the sharp, the shape functor takes geometric paths and it turns them into homotopical ones. So uh, we said that the, the homotopical objects are the, are the objects that think the, the, the geometric paths are the same as homotopical ones. And so the shape takes an object that contains geometric paths and it turns them into homotopical ones. So suppose, here's an example. Suppose that, remember the geometric circle, I, I defined it first as sort of a, the, some subspace of A2. Uh, but uh, often it happens that I can also write it as um, A1 mod Z. So if you like A1 the line, I think I can translate it by an integer, and then uh, I take the quotient by that, I'm just sort of wrapping the line around itself on the many times, and that's another way to define a circle. And often that gives me the same circle. Um, so that, what that, another way to say that is that I've got a co-equalizer here. Uh, I've got, this is sort of the adding, shifting by one, and the other one is the identity. The co-equalizer gives me this geometric circle. Um, Whenever this is true, then these two things have the, the these two circles have the same shape, because um, right. If I take this co-equalizer diagram and I hit it with shape, uh, then the shape of a one is a point, because I'm nullifying a one. That's this is sort of essentially by definition, shape is the thing which the, the reflector which takes a one to a point. So I get the co-equalizer in the category of homotopical objects, which might in general not be the same as the category in the entire as the co-equalizer in the whole category. The co-equalizer there, because I'm applying the left adjoint um, of to two maps from one to itself. Um, as the, the homotopical circle, S1, is the co-equalizer in the ambient category of the two map, uh, uh, maps from one to itself, uh, two identity maps from one to itself. And so again, when I hit it with shape, I get the same co-equalizer in the category of homotopical objects. So these two, these two circles have the same shape in, in, in in general, so, so from here I'm not, I'm not necessarily assuming this cohesive fact, but that, that's even going to be true down here. But in the, co in, in the, the special thing about the cohesive world is that the discrete objects are also co-reflective with this, this flat. And so that means that they're closed under co-limits, just like a, a reflective subcategory is closed under limits, a co-reflective subcategory is closed under co-limits. So that means that this co-equalizer in the ambient category, which is the, the homotopical S1 here, is already discrete. And so it's already homotopical, it's equivalent to its shape. And so in that case, the shape of the topological circle is the homotopical circle. Um, in general, I can think of this shape as computing the fundamental infinity group order. So I take all the continuous, the geometric or continuous paths and turn them into higher infinity group orders. In the algebraic case, I think you can think of this as some sort of motivic plane number of infinity group order. Okay, um, so uh, maybe that's a good time to pause for questions. Uh, yeah. So is this shape related to the pro state shape? It is. Um, the uh, the pro space shape is more general. So so this um, I, uh, there's a word here uh, that I didn't mention. G locally contractible. So uh, the uh, uh, the locally contractible it tells you is what tells you that this sort of um, uh, flat has a left adjoint. Um, the the, the pro-space shape is what happens when you're not locally contractible and you sort of start imagining what this left adjoint would look like if it existed. And it has the pro left adjoint. And, and it has a pro left adjoint. Right. And that, 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 by the way, is where the word shape for this operation comes from, because it was first used to be pro Other questions? Yes. Do 
it, de it depends on exactly what you mean. So uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll probably say more about this, the, exactly what sort of categorical structure these things correspond to tomorrow. But um, the, uh, the flat is essentially always there because it's basically just it's the, the, the global sections in the discrete thing. Um, the, the, the sharp uh, is not always there. So that corresponds to, to sort of having uh, 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 you're, in a, you're in a local purpose, which basically means that uh, there's a, there's a <coughs> you know, things are determined by points. It's a right eye joint to the global section. So, um, this, that, the, 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 the sharp is kind of telling you about whether you're in a, uh, a, a, a gross topos or a petite topos, which I have no idea. But, but you know what I mean, right? Like there's, whether you're, if you're like topos, if you're talking about sheaves on a particular space, then you don't have a sheaf sharp. But if you're on like sheaves on the world of all spaces, then you do get one. Does that, does that answer the question? Uh, yeah. Okay, maybe we can ask yeah. that later. Other questions? So uh, I thought the global sections was the, um, was the left, uh, uh, like you have a geometric morphism to the terminal yeah, topos. And so, uh, why wouldn't you have a sharp? The global sections is, is the P lower star, and then P upper star is its right adjoint, and flat is the composite, which is an, a, oh. an endomorphism of this guy. Okay. okay, so to get a right adjoint to that, oh, okay. you need a right adjoint to P lower star. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, um, uh, I want to say something about what the type theory looks like that we just use to describe these modalities. Um, so uh, this is a point that uh, uh, Fuller raised briefly uh, in a question to Egbert. Um, so I, I think this slide will answer. Um, the uh, uh, a reflective subuniverse, uh, like Egbert was describing, is more than just uh, a reflective subcategory of the model, uh, because uh, as Egbert said, it's a uh, uh, it's an endomorphism of the universe. So if, if, if diamond is my reflective right now reflector, then it maps the universe to itself. And that means that uh, I end up uh, categorically, I end up with a reflective subcategory of every slice category, uh, or of every so category of small objects in the slice, or whatever, depending on what your, your universe looks like. But right, if, I, if I have an uh, a morphism here, which is classified by, it's, it's a pullback of the, the universal map uh, on the universe, uh, then I can, uh, I can apply my uh, diamond, my, my reflector on the universe, and then pull back in that bigger square, and I get a fiber-wise reflection of this y over x. Right? Um, and so uh, that's, in general, uh, that's more structure than I than, than on a on the reflective. Okay, right? If it's for me, tell them I'll get it for the break. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's more structure on a reflective subcategory than you would expect um, for uh, an arbitrary one to have. Uh, but uh, because we can construct localization at uh, any family of maps that I can show this with a higher vector type, that means that if I have a, an accessible reflective subcategory, so meaning that it's determined by localization at something, then I, I can always extend it to uh, a reflective subvibration in the sense that I, it's acting fiber wise. There might be more than one such extension uh, in general, but at least there's some way to do it. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, and what the, the monadic modalities, so these are the, the ones that are closed under sigmas that I was talking about at the end, um, those have the extra property that this gives me a stable factorization system. So uh, y mapping to x, um, this is the right factor in its factorization. The left factor is the unit mapping to y into this guy. Uh, and uh, that in, in, the, in the sigma closed case, 
that gives me a factorization system to stay with. <coughs> um, the, so these, these things here um, in the in the hot book and in uh, a paper um, I think with Edward and Boss, these are called just modalities. Uh, but that's really just a sort of a shorthand because they're the only ones we're interested in uh, at the moment. In, in general, it's better to call these monadic modalities, or maybe even better, idempotent monadic modalities, uh, because uh, we're also interested in these sort of co-monadic, uh, co-reflective ones, like flat. So, uh, and for those, there's more. There's more of a problem. So, so shape and and sharp are reflective, talking about reflective subcategories. And so we can expect to extend these uh, to uh, these reflective sub vibrations and sort of see them internally as reflective subcategories, sort of as reflective subvibrations or modalities. Um, uh, and as I said, for shape, that's pretty clear because it's defined but to be nullification at, at this line object. It's less clear what the generators for sharp are, but they, they exist in different models. Um, but that's not true for flat. Uh, and uh, the problem um, was that there, there's no way to define internally uh, in ordinary book hot uh, what I mean by a co-reflective subuniverse in such a way that it will include the desired examples. Um, and, uh, and here's an internal proof inside a book hot that that's impossible. Suppose I, I, mean, I just write down what I mean by a co-reflective subuniverse in sort of a naive way by turning all the arrows around in the definition that I go from up. Uh, then uh, it turns out that the only ones, uh, every, every, every co-reflective subuniverse is of the form x times p for some proposition p. Now, not, these are not totally uninteresting, but they certainly don't include flat. Uh, and uh, here, here's a sketch of how that happens. So given um, uh, this one of these things, uh, p is, is box of one, it's the co-reflection of the terminal object. And I'm going to define maps back and forth between box of x and x times box one. Um, this one is the, going this way is easy because I have a map from x to one. So this is a functor, so I get a map from box x to box one. And so the universe is like mapping into a product. I have a co-unit in box x maps to x, and then I have this map from box x maps to box one. The other direction is a little bit is, is the fancier one. Um, given a point of x, I can regard it as a map from the terminal object to x, uh, from the point to x. And now if I apply box to that as, as, as a functor, I get a map from box one to box x. Uh, and now, so I got, I have one of those for every element of X, and I put those together and I get a map from X across box one into box X. And you can check that those are inverses using universal property. So um, the reason that this, that this proof works is that we can do this funny thing of taking a point in X and then uh, applying box under the assumption that we have a point in, that have a particular point in X, and then just sort of do that in a parametric way and get this map from the product. And semantically, what that means is that uh, if I write down the definition of a co-reflective subuniverse in type theory and translate it into the semantics, what I get is a co-reflective subcategory of every slice category, um, just as I did in, in this case, right? It's exactly the same thing. And that doesn't exist in general. If I have a co-reflective subcategory, I can't in general extend it to a co-reflective subvibration of all slices. Um, so what we need to do is we need some way to represent inside of type theory this idea of a co-reflective subcategory that doesn't let me do it fiber-wise. Okay. Before you go on, yes. the uh, generators of sharp, are these something like the negated propositions? Like it would be often they, often they are the double negated propositions, yeah. The, 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 often it coincides with the double negation, uh, with the category double negation sheets. Uh, uh, and, uh, sometimes, uh, at least in the, in the topological case, um, it's also the localization at the map from the discrete real numbers to the topological real numbers. Mm -hmm. So just forcing uh, the, the topology on the reals to coincide, and that's enough because they put everything is generated by that. I'm not sure quite how generally that's true. Any questions? Okay. Sorry, yeah. the, the shot. The sharp mode objects should be equivalent to the flat mode ones. Equivalent, but not, they're not the same. But I mean, if, if you're saying the double negation sheets, then this means that your best category has to be non negative. That's right. So uh, by infinity group whites, I usually mean classical infinity group whites okay. uh, constructed in CFC or whatever. Um, we, but then why, why is it important that you say negative propositions? Because all you Negative. Internal right. propositions. Uh, this, model, this model is not classical. Right. Um, uh, so the negative so propositions in the bigger one. Right. So, so this often, 
this is the category of double negation she used in this one. It's called this is classical, but this is not. And if you start from a non-classical base, you could build something similar, but then Sharp won't be the double negation she used. Okay, so um, the simplest thing to say uh, is that flat can only apply, be applied in the empty context. So the, the empty context theoretically corresponds to saying that we're talking about the category itself and not any slice category. And that would, that would block this proof because here we're, we're applying box in the context of a variable belonging to the type X. So that would prevent us from doing that. Okay. Um, that works, but it's not really good enough for a lot of the things we want to do. Um, a better solution is to say that flat can be applied whenever any, everything in the context is discrete. Uh, and semantically, what that means is saying, like this, the, the simple one is just saying we have a co-reflective subcategory. Um, this is saying it's not just a co-reflective subcategory, it's, it's an indexed co-reflective subcategory. So with that, uh, I, I'm not looking at. I'm not just looking at. I'm not looking at all slice categories of the geometric objects, but I'm looking at the slice categories over discrete ones, and that's 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 important. Uh, anybody, I mean, um, people who know something about topos theory are nodding their heads because we do this all the time in topos theory. It's just like when you have a, um, a geometric morphism, you think about the things upstairs as indexed over the things in the base category. But the, the base category is kind of like the category of sets. So you, well, you want to be able to talk about sort of families of, of geometric objects indexed by a subset. And, and so this is sort of a, this is basically a way to do that. Uh, and so we want to do something similar here. We allow everything in the context to be discrete. Um, now, how do we do that type theoretically? Right? We've, got to, we've got to change the rules of type theory. We're not just going to be able to write down some axioms. Um, and so the, most, the first thing you might try is to do something like this, to say like whenever I have everything in the context that has a flat on it, then I can apply flat to some type. Um, and that, that sort of works, but it, um, it doesn't, it's not the best thing to do. And uh, so on this slide, I'm going to explain why it's not the best thing to do for a type theorist. And on the next slide, I will explain it for a category theorist. Uh, or I'll try. Uh, so uh, if we actually, if we do it this way, then um, it, it, the problem with type theory is that it breaks the admissibility of substitution. Uh, so uh, what that means um, is that uh, uh, sort of in, 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 in for practical matters is that uh, if I write down a term, uh, then you can't, it's, there's no, there's no, there, there, you won't be able to decide whether that term is valid without knowing how I constructed it from other terms by substituting things into it. And so uh, ordinarily in type theory, when I write down a term, um, I can take variables in it and substitute other things into it. Um, and then I still get a valid term. But after I've done the substitution, um, you can look at the term that I've got and check that it makes sense and, and validate its type without knowing how I got it by substituting it from other things. But if you do this, then that, you can't do that anymore. I would have to tell you how I substituted things into it in, in order for you to check that it's a valid term and figure out what its type is. And that's really a problem for trying to sort of implement things and, and, and for even being able to communicate with each other using form. So um, instead what we do is we, 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 we add these things called, that I what we call crisp variables here. So um, uh, the, the idea here is we've got, um, we're splitting the context. We've got two different kinds of variables in the context. We've got ordinary variables here, which we write in the ordinary way with a single colon. And then we've got these other kinds of variables that we write with a double colon. We call them those crisp variables. Um, and the type theoretic way to think about that is that um, we, uh, we're internalizing this modality flat is to find to internalize this judgmental double colon in the same way that the Cartesian product internalizes the comma that we put between ordinary types in the context. So uh, this is a judgment, a thing in the judgmental structure, and then this is a type out there, a type operation that, that reflects it or reifies it in a similar way that maps from A column B are semantically the same as maps from A cross B, uh, but we represent them differently in the type theory so that it behaves well and substitutes itself. If you didn't know what any of that means, that's okay. Um, you can tune back in now and kind of move this guy into category theory. Um, so uh, let's think about it in terms of model categories. So uh, as, as Steve said, um, I'm going to think about these things as simplicial three sheets. Uh, so I've got let E be my model category for the geometric things. Uh, S is the model category for ordinary ones, so it's that simplicial sets, uh, basically. And we have uh, this adjunction here, which is now a model category theoretic adjunction, adjunction. 
Um, and uh, we, regard, we regard E as indexed over S by this left adjoint. So um, the, uh, the A indexed object is the slice over this discrete object, E star, upper star of A. Um, and the ordinary type operations are all the structure of E. So we're, 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 st we're still thinking about, which is just an enhancement of the internal type theory of E. So all of our types sort of represent objects of E or, or, or vibrations of E. Um, and so you know, we've got these two different kinds of contexts. And these two different kinds of contexts correspond to ordinary indexing in the slice over an object of E um, or indexing over the corresponding dis discrete reflection. So just like I said, like that this double colon, A x double colon A is supposed to be kind of like flat. So x double colon A is, is kind of like x is in flat A. So semantically, it's in p upper star, p lower star of A, which, which I said before was flat. Flat was p upper star, p lower star. But that's, that was in the, the infinity category world. In the model categorical world, flat can't be quite the same as p upper star, p lower star, because it might not be fiber. Flat is supposed to be a type. Types are fibered objects or vibrations. So p upper star, p lower star isn't quite fibered. We need to replace it by the fibered object, and that's flat. So that's the difference between semantic, semantically, you can think about that as being the difference between the double colon A and the flat A is that one is the fiber replacement of the other. Uh, and then that becomes a little more clear in a couple of slides when I describe the construction of flat uh, in, in, in this model categorical case. But um, let me just uh, remind, uh, talk about the, the terminology here for a moment. Um, so as I said, this x double colon A is called a crisp variable. Um, if, uh, if I have a, a crisp variable belonging to a proposition, I say that the proposition holds crisply or is true crisply. Um, ordinary variables, we, might, we sometimes call cohesive variables for emphasis to, to, to remind ourselves that they're not crisp. Um, having a crisp variable in a type is a stronger hypothesis than having a cohesive so uh, the uh, some of this just hold crisply also holds cohesively. So the way to think about it is that um, if I'm assuming a crisp element of some type, that means I have an element of that type, but um, everything that I do with it doesn't have to depend on it continuously or, or, or cohesively. So if I say for every real number x, blah, 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 then my construction will end up, have, has to depend continuously on x. Whereas if I say for every crisp real number x, blah, 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 blah then I'm allowed to do constructions that don't depend continuously on X. Or geometric or whatever the cohesion is. Oops, sorry. Yes. It's easy to see formally that you can give them, give them a crisp variable and you can get a cohesive variable. Uh, well, it depends on, on the rules for manipulating the type theory, which I haven't told you. <laughs> OK. Uh, so uh, the, the, um, the, the way we set things up, uh, it ends up being an, an invisible rule that everything that's crisp is also cohesive. Um, you could you could set it up in other ways as well. Um, but, um, it, it, it's true because of the way we set up the judgmental structure. But isn't it just by the by the cohesive to be in the slice of the A then? Semantically, yeah. You can go to the slice of A. Yeah. Yeah. But this you can't yeah. you can't do it for Right. Yeah, right. So, so the, syntactically, you have to set up the syntax so that it works. And, and the reason you can do that is because semantically, you have the code that um, mapping code that you can apply it in the helpful form. Um, th there isn't, uh, when, we, when we say a crisp term or a crisp conclusion, something on the right hand side of the term style, that just means that it only has crisp variables in it. Um, so anything which depends only on crisp variables is itself crisp and can be substituted for a crisp variable. So that the thing that I can't do, and I can't take a, a cohesive term, something that depends continuously on a variable x, and plug it in for uh, something that's, that, that is allowed to be discontinuous and get something new. So um, here's, here's a sketch of, of a way to build flat uh, in, this, in, a, in a model category. So, uh, and as I said, we, we have this, this judgments that look like this in the syntax, where we have two groups of, of hypotheses, two groups of variables. Um, the, the delta, the ones on the left, are the crisp variables, and the gamma, the ones on the right, are the cohesive variables. So the, the, uh, the mnemonic here is that delta stands for discrete, um, because those are sort of the discrete things. And gamma, we ordinarily denote context by gamma, so that sort of ordinary. Um, and a semantic interpretation of this is that delta is, is sort of um, supposed to be uh, uh, discrete, so we apply this uh, um, uh, strict um, discretization to it, and then gamma depends on that, so it's a vibration orbit. And then if I have another type 
in this context, that's a vibration over gamma, which is then also a vibration over uh, this vector set. Now, I want to apply, I want to compute flat, I want to construct flat of A. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to apply this guy, because that's my, my uh, model categorical version of discretizations. And I get this map here, this to this to this. Um, that's not necessarily a vibration, so I'm going to vibrantly replace it. Okay, factor it as a as a basic filtration followed by a vibration. Uh, and so uh, note that this now lives not over gamma anymore, but over p star p star now. So uh, in order to make the, to write this in the type theory, what happens is if I have a type over gamma and uh, delta and gamma, then flat a, um, I have to move gamma over into the discrete the crisp context because now I've got my p star p star on it just like I did on delta. And the similar thing happens when right, the, 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 they have an introduction rule for flat, which is this map here, which says given a crisp ob, uh, variable in A, so that's something in P star P star A, <coughs> I can map it into flat A, and I'll call that X upper flat, which lives in flat. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the formation rule for flat and the introduction rule for flat. Um, but uh, that those are, those, this rule is not expressed yet. So uh, types that you're thinking flat of don't have to be crisp. Um, they become crisp once you have flat of them. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say something about that in just a moment, right? So, so I, I, I uh, that's right. Here, A is not necessarily crisp. Um, it, but uh, when I flat it, then all the non-crisp variables that it depended on have become crisp. Um, but uh, there's, there's certain, what that means is that there's no point to formulating this rule in such a way that A can depend on non crisp variables. I could have just constructed it with the more crisp. Right, right, because, because uh, any crisp variable can be used as a cohesive variable. And, and, right, so, so there's no point to breaking up the context up in the premise here because this is a stronger hypothesis than having gamma already over in the discrete variables. So I may as well formulate it like this and get rid of the gamma entirely and just say that. Um, I can only apply flat to something that depends on discrete things. And that's because the intuition that I said back before, that we, we can apply flat whenever everything in the context is discrete or crisp in this case. So now I've got, uh, this is my rule here. Um, uh, I can, when we have crisp, I, I can flat it, and then with a crisp variable belonging to A, I can, I can upper flat it and get into flat A. And now I, I want to write it in sort of the nice type theoretic way, which allows really general contexts and um, allow me to substitute some, something um, admissibly for the crisp variable. And so I get these rules for, for flat formation and flat introduction. Um, and if you care about that sort of thing, then you probably already know about that. If you don't care about it, then you don't. Um, the, the, the idea here <laughs> is that uh, well, from inside of flat on a type or upper flat on a term, I can't see the cohesive variables outside. I can only see, so when I'm, doing, when I'm, when I'm constructing flat of something or, or upper flat of something, I can only use the, the crisp variables uh, when I'm doing that inside. Okay, uh, and, and here, so, so flat is supposed to be a type rule, a type forming operator. So it should have a formation rule and an introduction rule and an elimination rule. Um, here's the formation rule, here's the introduction rule, here's the elimination rule. Um, it looks a little bit complicated, but basically it's just saying that this is an acyclic co-vibration. Um, just like, like for identity types, we have an acyclic co-vibration, so I can lift it against the vibration. So um, I'm doing it in a general context, so uh, here's, some, here's my vibrant replacement of flat A. But now, um, uh, in my, when I'm doing my elimination, this type C could depend on other cohesive variables. There's nothing that, uh, wrong with that. So what I, that means I can have some gamma here, which is a vibration over P star P star delta, and I can pull this all back along that. And so the A doesn't depend on anything in gamma, but my, my other hypotheses of my elimination can. So because uh, I'm in a nice model category, this pullback here is again an acyclic vibration. And so that means that um, whenever I have a type dependent on gamma, delta, and gamma, and flat A, so I have a vibration over flat A, this pullback of flat A then I can lift it against this acyclic co-vibration from P star P star A. So the P star P star A corresponds to a crisp variable in A. And so this is my sort of uh, in, in hypothesis for my introduction rule, my, my elimination rule. And then given that, I can define this section of C that depends on a cohesive variable in flat A. So the, the idea here is that uh, uh, 
whenever I have, uh, I want to define something, if, I, if I've got a cohesive variable belonging to flat A, then I can sort of do flat induction on it and turn it into a crisp variable belonging to A. So in that sense, flat, flat A is at least the same as sort of crisply A, um, but in this sort of precise type theoretic sense. And then I, I, I propagate this to make it type theoretic. Uh, and then uh, here's my computation rule that if, so, so what this syntax here says, given B, which is a term in flat A, then I'm going to allow, suppose that it's, it's, it's upper flat of something, and then I can use that crisp variable U to construct some other thing. And this, what this computation rule says that, well, if the thing I started from was already upper flat of something, then that's sort of basically doing what I thought it was, I was going to do in that case to that. So basically, like the, the elimination rule following the introduction rule is the identity versus sort of what you expect for a nice multi-hit type. Yeah. Um, is there a uh, reason you use this explicit substitution instead of like a crisp pi type? Um, um, it's simpler because you don't need to, to introduce the crisp pie, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't thought about the semantics of the crisp pie, but it probably works. Yeah, actually, I don't know. But some, yeah, <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, implementations like, like Agaflat use a crisp pie. Um, so it's, it's not unreasonable to have a crisp pie. But, but this way, I mean, this way you can formulate this rule all by itself without reference to any other type formulas. In order to really get the type theory that rule to work out, right, you have to assume that the fiber replacement is on the right or something somatic. Um, because you're throwing in a fiber replacement, but that's not going to be even corporeal unless you. I mean, you can, like that. you can do the same uh, uh, universe of local universe tricks to do the identity type. You know, that already have that problem. Okay, so you're not assuming that this is strictly the same. Well, yeah, you'll, you'll have to be strictly <laughs> you have to be strictly in order to actually model the type theory, yeah. but here I'm just describing it in, in sort of non coherent Okay, so as an example of how to use this, uh, here's the co-unit of flat defined internally in what means sort of semantically. Uh, so we've got, uh, uh, I, want to, I want to map from flat A to A, what do I do? So if I have a, a cohesive variable in flat A, then by flat induction, I can assume that it came from a crisp variable in A, and then I can use that crisp variable as a cohesive one and give me an element of A. So that gives me a map from flat A to A. That's the co-unit. Um, and uh, so I'm going to write this co-unit as lower flat. Uh, and then uh, we have this sort of computation rule that if I have a crisp variable and I, 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 I make it into something in flat A, and then I map it back into A, I get B back in. Um, so let me just end by, by um, describing a few properties of flat that we can prove uh, from this, uh, this type theory. So um, we, um, the, the computation rule that I wrote here, that's a beta rule. Uh, we expect to also have an eta rule uh, for most type, for, for most type formers. Um, the, uh, and uh, here, flat is being a positive type former. It's sort of like an inductive thing, because our, our elimination rule is sort of a, an induction rule for mapping out of it. And so just like, say, co-products or push-outs or whatever, we don't put the data rule in as, as a rule. Instead, we prove it uh, uh, as a type of equality, um, proposition of equality. So if I have a function, uh, a dependent function defined on flat A, uh, uh, then it is equal to what I would get by sort of restricting it back to um, crisp variables in A and then extending it again. So what this, this here is saying, if I have, uh, I have a, uh, uh, a cohesive variable in flat A, I can suppose that it came from, oh, I thought I'm actually going to be a number flat there. Uh, so I can suppose that it came from a crisp variable in A, and then I can put that back into flat A and apply F. And so uh, this, uh, this, that should give me back F again. Uh, and you can prove that by flat induction. And I'm trying to prove something about all cohesive variables in flat A, so I can assume that it came from uh, some crisp variable in A, and then the computation rule tells me that this thing on the left reduces to the thing on well, the same thing on the right. Um, in a similar way, I can show that that, that um, this uh, flat induction commutes with itself. Uh, so uh, uh, um, yeah, 
details of that are not all that important. <laughs> uh, just like if I, uh, uh, whenever I have these two things that I want to compare, I do a flat induction, and then they both reduce to the same thing. And I can I can prove the flat as a functor. Um, so uh, if I have a map from A to B, I want to define flat of it. Well, so I have something in flat A. Uh, I suppose that it came from a crisp variable in A. Then uh, oh, whoops, there's something missing here. This is important. F has to be a crisp function in order to apply flat to it. Because how, what, what, what works, what, why is that? So I have F, X is in flat A. I have to destruct it and suppose that it came from a crisp variable in A. Then I want to get into B by applying F. And I get F of U in B. And now I want to put that into flat B. But I can only do that if F of U is crisp. And if F is, if F is, is not crisp, then F of U is not crisp. So I need F to be crisp. Uh, that's a terrible typo. Um, to get f of u to be allowed to apply for a flat to it, to get it to flat b. Makes sense. So, so flat, just like flat, can only be applied to crisp types. The functorial action of flat can only be applied to crisp functions. And similarly, I can prove that it's a functorial using this com uh, commutation rule that I used on the other slide, uh, and, and, and show that it is in fact a co-reflection sort of all the other properties that I would expect from this. Okay, so that's this is this is how we we make rules for type theory. So we augment type theory by these extra rules, this this formalism of crisp variables, and then we can introduce flat as as a type former that sort of behaves well type theoretically. It has a visible substitution and and has a sort of this this harmony between its elimination and, and uh, um, uh, introduction rules, uh, and it corresponds semantically to this this, this sort of reasonable fragment replacement. So I think that's probably a good place to stop. Um, next time I'll sort of connect this to, sh to shape and, and sharp and talk a little bit more about the semantics. Any unanswered questions left? Um, I haven't actually used it myself, but I'm told that there is an egg flat that has a that has flat in it. Um, it's a uh, all the rooms are unique. Uh, um, I mean, unique is improved rather than this, but, but the computation rule that they have. It's, it's I believe it's an implicit function. Um, so flat is implemented as an implicit function type, but with a sort of implicit prime, like it's the same code for implicit function types, but it's not flat um, function types. So uh, you're talking about the crisp pie? Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's. So in general, you, you have two complex pie. Yeah. And there, there are. See, that's what I, I don't I don't really know. I just know that so so Agda has sort of a the same. It's not implicit. I mean, uh, irrelevant. 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 Yes. Yeah, sorry. It has a relevant function types and the same rules for that. So if if you were even a relevant, if you were irrelevant, then every Every three variable in you also has to be relevant, and that happens to be the same rule as Chris. So, um, so it works effectively the same way. Yeah. So if you if you actually um, if you look at the, uh, it will tell you that it's a Chris term, and you will see that they have different rules, and it will complain if you try to substitute in for something that should be Chris or something. Any more questions? Okay, then let's thank Mike again. And I'd like to remind you to tell me if you want to go to the dinner. You want to show hands right now? Yeah, I guess that's enough. Twenty three, yeah, okay, twenty three. That sounds good. <laughs> so, yeah, next talk is at two, and there are a couple of ideas that you could have <coughs> on the web page. 
So we'll check if that one out. Schatz dining room is uh